What began over 35 years ago ends tonight. With the final episode of Picard now over, we've all experienced a season of Star Trek we will remember fondly for generations to come. Yes, pun intended. As we delve into this final episode, we certainly hope Paramount is prepping the team who created this show for their next Star Trek adventure to entertain us all. And don't forget to stay tuned to the end to get a special inside look at this final episode directly from the mouth of showrunner Terry Metalis himself. So you don't want to miss this episode. You're not going alone. And I will make it a threesome. Do you even hear yourself? And stay tuned until later where we'll be showing you the last wallet you'll ever want to own. Well, that's just as fascinating as the first 89 times you told me that. Last week's episode ended with our Next Generation crew learning the Enterprise D has been lovingly repaired by Geordi and they are going to use it to stop the Borg before they can assimilate Earth. As Picard says engage with authority, the D leaps to warp and they are off to save the galaxy one more time. Jean-Luc, wherever you go, we go. This episode begins with the voice of President Anton Chekhov. This is President Anton Chekhov of the United Federation of Planets broadcasting on all emergency channels. Of course, Star Trek the original series fans will know Pavel Chekhov. This man's ancestor was likely the pilot for the USS Enterprise NCC-1701 and Captain James T. Kirk. It is possible that Anton is Pavel's son. Pavel was 22 years old when he joined the Enterprise in 2267. He might have had a son right around 2300 and lived into the 2440s since the average life expectancy of his time was 100 years. That means Anton could be his son and is delivering this message at near 100 years old with current life expectancy now around 120. Also, the name Anton is a nice nod to actor Anton Yelchin, who played the 2009 movie version of Pavel Chekhov in J.J. Abrams' alternate Star Trek universe. Take off your shirt, Chekhov. Roll over, Chekhov. Breathe deeply, Chekhov. We learn that Space Dock is holding back the fleet, but it won't last much longer. Picard realizes the Borg signal must be close, and Data discovers there is a Borg signal coming from Jupiter. We then learn that they hit a trans-warp conduit in the gases of Jupiter inside the Red Eye. As Beverly searches for Jack, Worf confirms that her son is the command signal, and we learn the Borg is amplifying the connection. Picard tells us to save Earth, they need to stop that signal, whatever it takes. He then tells us that what began over 35 years ago ends tonight. The camera pans out and we see what is a humongous Borg cube that the D will be facing off against. Over at Space Dock, the Borg-led fleet of Starfleet ships are firing continuously. On board the Titan, the Borg have discovered Seven and Rafi. They get to the bridge and a firefight ensues, but the Borg merely transport down into the transporter room and Rafi locks them inside. A few of the older crew members who survived take the bridge with Seven. Back on the D, we learn the Borg cube is only 36% operational and most of its resources are being used to transmit the signal. Deanna is having a feeling she's never had before. She describes it as a quiet suffering and we learn Data hates the Borg. She senses Jack, but he's totally consumed by the collective. Worf asks, what if he is at the point of no return? But Picard insists he is still in there and he is still Jack. The cube's shields lower and it appears they are being invited in. I love it when Star Trek does Star Trek stuff. Data brings up a screen with life signs and Beverly thinks to have the computer isolate life sign energy signatures that mimic human neuro frequencies. The computer isolates Jack and Beverly is going to use that information to find him. Picard is going down and everyone wants to go as well. Despite the serious tone, Worf brings levity saying he will make it a threesome. And Riker says, do you even hear yourself? Picard, Riker, and Worf beam to the cube, and it feels just like an old TNG episode. Picard turns around before getting on the turbo lift and says, It's been an honor serving with you all. If you teared up a little there, don't feel bad, you aren't alone. Picard, Riker, and Worf beam to the cube, and it feels just like an old TNG episode. On the Borg cube, we learn that there should be thousands of drones, but everything is quiet. The drones seem to be dead, we learn they are being consumed to sustain something or someone. Picard believes they are trying to replace their Borg army with the people from Earth. We also learn some small part of Picard is compatible with the Hive still. Picard tells Riker and Worf he can't be their captain. He needs to be a father. He sends Riker and Worf to find the beacon, and he has an emotional moment thanking Will and saying goodbye to Worf. 
it feels as if we are about to lose someone here. Beverly leads Picard to Jack's location, and Jean-Luc tells her she did everything right with Jack. Picard loses communication with Beverly, but finds Jack. We see he has now been turned into Borg, as he gives the Borg speech to civilizations who are about to be assimilated. He can't hear his father, and then we hear the Borg Queen's laugh. When we see her face, she has been damaged, and she is hardly recognizable. She tells Picard Jack is home with his true family, her. To his collective. To me. Back on the Titan, they learn that the Enterprise D and Picard is engaging the Borg. Seven says they need to buy as much time as they can for them. Rafi explains that if they can't see them, they can't control them, so they begin to cloak the Titan. Seven gives a rousing speech that they need to fight for their friends and families. She says, But in this moment, here and now, we are all that is left of Starfleet. Back over on the Borg Cube, the disfigured Borg Queen taunts Picard, but a shield protects her from Jean-Luc's phaser. The Queen tells us that Jack found her at the edge of space, where the Federation left the Borg poisoned and unable to consume any worlds. They were left to die, starving of old age. Picard tries to exchange Jack for himself. She tells him no, she doesn't want him. The future doesn't lie in assimilation, but in evolution, hinting that what has happened with the Borg DNA is part of her future plans to consume worlds. Riker and Worf find the beacon's coordinates. Jean-Luc tells the Borg Queen she's insane, but she replies that she invited him here to see his future's end. Back over to Riker and Worf, it appears some of the Borg are waking up. We get the confirmation that Changelings and Borg work together because they both had a bone to pick with the Federation. The Queen wants a new generation of Borg no longer to assimilate, but to annihilate everyone and everything. Worf begins kicking Borg butt, but they are coming on strong. The Borg cube begins firing at the D, and shields are down to 68%. Worf drops his Kurleth, and we learn it's incredibly heavy, but Worf has something hidden in the hilt of his new Klingon weapon. But before we tell you what that hidden thing is, let me quickly tell you about this video sponsor, Exter, who makes what we believe is the best wallet ever created. We just threw away our old wallets. Wanna know why? Because we just discovered the most efficient smart wallet in the world. Exter has revolutionized the wallet and we will never go back to Bifold. We are so impressed. Exter wallets are super slim and sleek. They are half the size of a conventional Bifold wallet. Compact and modular, they hold 12 cards cards or more plus cash. And that means no more stuffing that bulky, worn out bifold wallet into your back pocket. Forget sitting on that uncomfortable lump and slide extra into your front pocket instead. This high quality wallet combines Italian leather, space grade aluminum, and carbon fiber. Plus it includes built-in RFID blocking to protect you from wireless theft. And you know how hard it can be to replace all of your cards if your wallet is stolen. Exter includes a tracking card to help you keep an eye on your belongings with a map, and you can even ring it for location assistance. This is the last wallet you'll ever buy. To get an extra wallet like ours, visit shop.exter.com slash thepopcast. Get 25% off your order when you use code thepopcast at checkout. Join the wallet revolution and upgrade your quality of life with Exter today. Ah, I had no idea it was that heavy. The hell? In the hilt of the Kurleth is a powerful phaser, and Riker uses it to take down the Borg. This is a badass Klingon weapon, and it's small things like bringing Dan Curry, creator of the Batleth back, to make this weapon, where Metalis shows us he understands why it's important to be authentic to the history of Star Trek. On the D, Jordy didn't have time to work on the weapon systems, so Beverly has to do it manually. We get the thrilling TNG theme score as the D begins firing back at the Borg cube, doing serious damage. Jordy, Data, and Deanna look back at Beverly, and she tells them a lot has happened in the last 20 years. The perfect amount of levity at the perfect moment. Worf reminds us that swords are fun and sends the schematics to the transmitter back to the D. Jordy says it will be impossible to navigate through the cube to where they need to go. Data says he can do it, but Jordy tells him it's impossible. Data asks them to trust his gut, which catches everyone off guard. Not a very Data thing to say, but after a moment, Jordy says, let's go with Data's gut. Trusting each other has always been what TNG and Star Trek is all about. Data says hang on, and the D navigates through the interior of the cube. Back on Earth, space dock is destroyed and planetary fields are down. Earth is defenseless. 
The fleet begins targeting all the major cities, and as the Titan goes to help, Sidney Borg and her Borg team sabotage the ship and they lose their cloak. Back on the cube, Picard is unhooking Jack, but the Queen tells him you'll kill him and he is too far gone. On the Titan, it looks bleak as they are dead in the water. The Borg Queen tells Locutus that she has already won as the fleet descends on Earth. In a display of flying that even Tom Paris couldn't achieve, Data somehow gets them to the beacon. There, they learn that if they destroy the cube, everyone on it will be killed. But if they wait, it will cost them everyone in the galaxy. Jordy turns to Beverly and painfully she nods, knowing she is about to lose her son. Jordy attempts to beam Riker and Worf back, but Will won't leave Picard. Deanna tells him he'll only have a minute to get out. He tells her, I owe him a lifetime, the least I can spare is a minute. In typical Klingon fashion, Worf says there was a moment today where I was worried we might actually survive as they go off looking for Picard. Jean-Luc disconnects wires from the console and the Borg Queen becomes very worried, demanding to know what he's doing. Picard tells her, I swore I'd never come back to the Collective. He had been running for half of his life until now. Now he has something to go back for as he plugs himself into the Collective. This can only be described as one of the most badass visual montages in Star Trek history, with Picard delivering his famous, I am Locutus. It was emotional, with a flood of TNG feelings combined with the man we know Picard is today. Jean-Luc joins Jack in the hive mind, and we learn that Jack is feeling a sense of euphoria, no loneliness or fear. He is feeling perfect, and he feels that he is where he is meant to be. Picard tries to reach him. He tells Jack he joined Starfleet to find a family that he never had. He said he found them and he let them in, but he always had a barrier. He always felt there was something wrong with him. He waited to die alone in that vineyard, but now he realizes that Jack is the part of him that he never knew was missing. In this moment, there is not a man with a child who can't understand exactly what Jean-Luc is feeling. We've all experienced this moment when you realize that your child is like that puzzle piece that completes your life. But Jean-Luc's words don't reach him, and now out of time, the Enterprise destroys the beacon and there is only a minute left to get them off the cube. Their demise seems certain. Worf is ready to die with honor as they wait with Picard. Data can't get a lock on their signal. And when you get right down to it, the answer that every child needs to hear is that no matter what they choose, their parent will always be there for them. Jean-Luc tells him, if you won't leave, then I will stay here with you. And that finally gets Jack's attention. And just as Jack's eyes are welling with tears, so are ours as we make this video for you. Picard says he will stay with him until the end. Jack is overcome with emotion as his father tells him, you have changed my life forever, and he hugs his son. And like that, the spell is broken. We get a montage of everything Jack and Jean-Luc have been through together, and Vox is no more. Jack and Picard unplug from the system as Riker tells him Zadi that he loves her and that he will be waiting for her with their boy. But with that thought he sends out, Deanna is able to locate him, and she leaps into action, getting the ship closer to them. Jack rebukes the Borg Queen as she tells him he will be alone, and he tells her, I will not be alone. The Enterprise-D shows up overhead and beams all four of them onto the ship at the last moment as the Borg Cube blows up in their wake. And just as the young Borg are about to kill Seven, Rafi, and the older crew, the connection is broken and our young bridge crew returns to themselves. Back on the D, Jean-Luc leads his son onto the bridge and Jack hugs his mother as Will embraces Deanna. Worf, Jordy, and Data have a moment together and Jordy sees his girls with Seven and Rafi. And at that moment, we get the levity we need as an old Klingon falls asleep in his chair. Picard welcomes his son to the Enterprise as we fade to black. And then a captain's log begins with Riker's voice. Captain's log, stardate, shall we say one? Because it is a new day for Starfleet. We learn that Starfleet used the transporters to purge the Borg DNA from every young person thanks to the new head of Starfleet Medical Branch, Admiral Crusher. She also used what she learned to allow for the scanning of changelings to make sure they hadn't missed any. We learn that the changelings also didn't kill many of their targets. And it is at this moment we see the real Captain Tuvok, who is pardoning the command crew of the Enterprise for commandeering the Titan with Seven's help. As Seven thinks Tuvok is about to reprimand her, she tells him she will make it easy for him by resigning from Starfleet. Tuvok then tells her that her officer review was sent to him just prior to the events that happened. It is Captain Shaw back from the dead in holographic form. In a way only he can, 
Shaw breaks her down, and while he shares her negatives, he earnestly describes her as brave and loyal, and the book that she writes will be great. We get an awesome line from Shaw here that also further develops his character. He is a rule follower to the letter, but he says here that perhaps the rules she breaks were already broken. He says this with difficulty. There was more to Captain Shaw than we saw. Shaw's recommendation for Seven is that she is promoted to captain. With this, Tuvok denies her resignation and makes her a captain. Seven is overflowing with emotion. We then see Rafi talking to her ex-husband. Her son is talking about her and she gets to finally meet her granddaughter. In the middle of this, Worf walks in to see Rafi who tells her he has been told tears are the body's weapon against pain. We also learn Worf has never cried, which we expect nothing less. We also learn that Worf has repaired Rafi's relationship with her family. Someone lit all the monitors of her son's house up at the same time, and all of her classified valor commendations were displayed with her image. Neither of them say that Worf did this, but they both understand, and they show love for each other. And the Klingon who never hugs has one hug for Rafi. We then see Deanna with Data, who is trying to balance his emotions. In a hilarious moment, Deanna says, oh, we've gone an hour over our limit yet again. It's quite funny as we learn Data is weeping over seeing someone feed their cat. And while Data drones on, we see Deanna looking to book a beach vacation on the luminescent beaches of Kafar Prime. Of course, we learn that Kafar was where the Elios fled to after being attacked by an unknown enemy on Sarnia Prime at the beginning of the season. Data tells her that being human is just as difficult as the desire to be human and more complex than he ever considered. We have a cute moment with Will and Deanna, and then, one year later, we see the D at the Fleet Museum. Picard, Riker, and Geordi are on the bridge, reminiscing about their experiences with her. Geordi announces shutdown procedures as we hear Majel Barrett's voice one more time. Shutdown procedure initiated. I miss that voice. We then see Admiral Picard and Admiral Crusher arriving at space dock with Jack, who is in a Starfleet uniform. Ensign Jack is arriving at his first posting. Starfleet put him on a rapid track and Jack jokes about nepotism, but Jean-Luc tells him it's all him and names me nothing. Picard tells him, you never told me the name of the ship they're posting you to, and Jack tells him, why do you think I'm so nervous? It's not for me. We then see the Titan as the shuttle comes up to it. It's a gorgeous shot, but it's not the Titan anymore. She's been rechristened in honor of Picard and his crew. It's the Enterprise G. Jack says, names mean almost everything, as Picard thoughtfully looks at Beverly. Jack tells him, welcome to the Enterprise, Admiral. Jack enters the bridge and starts barking orders to the helm to set a course for the Metallus system before he sits in the captain's chair. Then we hear the familiar voice of Captain Seven, who tells him, out. Then we hear Rafi tell him, now, Ensign, as we learn she is Seven's number one. They are going out on a shakedown cruise. They are joined with the rest of the wonderful bridge crew that we got to know from the Titan, including Esmar, Mira, and Sydney. Jack is appointed special counselor to the captain and stays on the bridge. We then learn Seven's first official act of command is to give the legacy captain departure command. And just as she is about to say it, we move to an exterior shot of the ship as it leaps away. Perhaps Paramount is saving that for when Seven is the captain of her own series. Back at 10 Forward, our old TNG crew is closing it down again. We don't see her, but Geordi says Guinan has been giving them the side eye for the last half hour. Beverly wants Worf to sing and have another glass of prune juice. Will and Deanna are going on a vacation. Geordi asks Data to give a last toast. Data says there was a young lady from Venus, and everyone quickly stops him before he can go any further. Of course, this takes us back to the TNG first season, episode three, The Naked Time, where Data began to repeat a dirty quote he heard from someone in the shuttlecraft bay. There was a young lady from Venus whose body was shaped like a... Captain Picard cut him off in the episode by calling security, and Worf delivers his deadpan line, I don't understand their humor either. It was a great moment, and it's perfect here at the end of this episode. Data turns the toast over to Captain Picard. And we must take the current where it serves or lose our ventures. Picard's toast is from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. It's one of Brutus's most famous speeches and quite simply means to seize the day and take advantage of this good moment they are having, as while they cannot always control the path they are on, he hopes the tides of their life should continue in a course of happiness so that they may find their fortune. Riker tells him they are grateful to have ridden the tide with him. And with that, Picard breaks out the cards, and it wouldn't be a proper send-off if our friends weren't sitting at a table playing poker. 
The moment is absolutely priceless as Picard tells them the stars have always been in his favor. They seem genuinely happy in a way I am not sure we've ever seen them before. In this last moment, the look on Picard's face is Patrick Stewart sitting with his friends he's known for 36 years. And as the credits roll, you might go to turn off your TV, but don't. Suddenly, we see the Enterprise G in front of a star, and we are in Jack's quarters. He sets up a model of the Enterprise D, and then he sets a picture of his parents in place. And then we hear a voice, a voice we thought we'd never hear again. But look at you, a chip off the old block. It's the voice of Q, played by the Star Trek legend John Delancey. He tells Jack, well, look at you, a chip off the old block. Jack knows who he is. Jack tells him he thought he was dead. As we remember at the end of season two of Picard, Q told Picard he was dying, and we had a wonderful final moment between Jean-Luc and Q. But Q tells Jack he had hoped the next generation wouldn't think so linearly. He tells Jack he has much ahead of him. Jack reminds him that Q told his father humanity's trial is over. But Q says, It is for him. But I'm here today because of you. Oh my God, are you kidding me? We pulled our mouths off the floor in this moment as we realized that Terry Metalis and his team have truly set up a whole new show for us to explore. And frankly speaking, we and nearly every fan we know is going to be devastated if we don't get this. Yeah, I want it, yeah, I want it now. This new show should take us on new adventures, moving the Star Trek story forward from this point on. Do you want Paramount to put Terry Metalis in charge of a new show exploring more Star Trek in the 25th century? Oh yeah, oh hell yeah. If so, give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing as we'll be back to do this breakdown for Strange New Worlds. And stay tuned because in a moment, we are going to share with you thoughts on this final episode directly from the mouth of showrunner Terry Metalis himself. But first, what did you think of the show? Was it everything you'd hoped it'd be, or did it fall short of expectations? Will you miss our TNG heroes, or was this a good send-off? Tell us what you think, and let's talk about it in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting the channel and get your own Enterprise D-inspired graphic design from the amazing artists at Mixtees.com. Get 20% off your purchase by using coupon code THEPOPCAST. The link is in the description below. Oh yes. Go fly. And now, one more time, Star Trek Picard Season 3 showrunner, Terry Metalis. I really wanted to see Q again. I love the idea that even though we had seen some version of what Q might believe is a final scene with Picard, Q's infinite, and he goes on forever. And he says, oh, you're so linear. You could, you could have Q forever. Uh, and that he would spend a lot of time with the next generation. I like the idea in my head that when he was going to lean into Picard's ear and whisper at the end of All Good Things, he was actually going to talk about Jack. And why not do that here? Um, it's actually kind of one of my favorite scenes in the entire season, is that last moment with Jack and Q. It, 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 uh, it gives me goosebumps. And we didn't have a lot of time to shoot it. And I love John, um, and I love that final look on Ed, and I, I want to see that show. It was certainly the right ending to that story, and by right ending, it's the right beginning. You know, you want to know that your heroes go on, in this case. Obviously, I'd love to tell that story. Obviously, you know, but um, if not, then in your imagination, it's good to know that the Enterprise exists with Captain Seven and Jack and Rafi by her side going out there with Esmar and Mura, you, you know, that, 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 that it exists and it's, it's, a, it's a fitting ending. Of course, lay it in, sir. She's ready. Engage. 